Faith and Persecution – How to Protect Religious Freedom In the interview, CDU-CSU Parliamentary Group Leader Volker Kauder. Mr. Kauder, hundreds of thousands of Christians have left Iraq and Syria in the past years and months. Almost every day we hear reports about systematic persecution, expulsion, even murder. No one reacts anymore in Europe. How do you explain that? Of course we see these things, and we find them deplorable. Right now in the German parliament we're talking about Iraq and how we can take in more refugees. The German president has spoken about it. The situation in Iraq is alarming because the Islamist group ISIS wants to establish an Islamist state and the Christians there are coming under enormous pressure. We have information that Christians are being forced to live under Sharia law. This is all very alarming and terrible for the people there. You're very engaged with the situation of persecuted Christians and other minorities. Perhaps more than other parliamentarians, what's your motivation? I believe that freedom is of the utmost importance for humanity. And there's no freedom without freedom of religion. We see in many countries where there's no religious freedom that other kinds of freedom don't exist either. That's my motivation. But I'm not solely concerned about Christians. I'm concerned about freedom of religion, but Christians are the most persecuted religious group. Does that concern stem from a pivotal personal experience or from your role as a Christian? It's an issue that's occupied me for many, many years. It's been thrust into the foreground now because, despite everything that we thought, religion once again is playing a hugely important role in global politics. In light of the present conflict, but also 20 years ago in the Balkans and other conflicts of the past decades, why do we so often equate religion with intolerance? The marginalization of other beliefs, even violence. Why is that association so strong today? In the Middle East and Africa especially, we're seeing religious groups caught up in political conflicts. In those places, and in the Balkans we saw the same thing, the government isn't able to maintain order and guarantee people's safety. And so we see persecution. That's something we have to take very seriously. Unfortunately, we can't seem to make any progress on this issue at the United Nations. Egypt is one country where you're especially active. The country's 8 to 10 million Coptic Christians continue to suffer, perhaps even more than ever. What's your personal experience there? Here in Berlin you often meet with Egyptians and Coptic Christians. Coptic Christians have had a very difficult time. It was especially hard when the Muslim Brotherhood was in power. At the moment, their situation has slightly improved because the new president, Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, has brought more stability, and he's clamping down on violence. As we see in Egypt, for democracy and freedom of religion to flourish, we need stable political conditions. With that very argument, the German government has been exporting weapons to many of these crisis regions for decades. Some of the main recipients of those arms exports have been Saudi Arabia, Algeria, Pakistan and Indonesia. Those countries are all in the top 10 for persecuting Christians and restricting religious freedoms. Turkey has received a large number of hand weapons and even there Christians are killed every few years. It doesn't make sense. How can Germany criticize other countries over human rights and freedom of expression when those very countries get their weapons from Germany.
auf der anderen Seite äh, gerade als, als Unfreiheit dastehen und Waffen aus Deutschland kriegen. Da muss man jedes Land einzeln anschauen. Die Türkei you have to look at each country individually. Turkey is a NATO member, and as such, they have a right to demand support. That includes support with weapons. We have clear guidelines not to deliver arms to so-called countries in crisis, but the term does not cover freedom of religion. Saudi Arabia is not in crisis. It's a stable country, but a country without religious freedoms. I think it's something we have to pay more attention to. But in the case of Saudi Arabia, it's a country that contributes to maintaining stability in the region. It's a counterbalance to the power of Iran. Sometimes there can be a sharp contradiction between general political interests, like regional stability, and the human right to freedom of religion. But politically, that's like having to choose between the plague and cholera. Countries like Saudi Arabia, Qatar or Pakistan have handed out death sentences to Christians. That means we have the ongoing responsibility to press for religious freedoms. If all of those countries guaranteed freedom of religion, Saudi Arabia, Iran, that would solve many of the political problems. The UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion or Belief, Heiner Bielefeld, said that a main cause of religious intolerance was massive corruption, massive corruption and authoritarian rulers. Should there be more political action against corruption as a means of bringing about more freedom of religion? The point made by Mr. Bielefeld is completely correct. I said myself that stable political conditions go a long way toward guaranteeing freedom of religion. Corruption is not a stable political condition. As part of our international cooperation and dialogue, we have to put more emphasis on good governance. Good governance is an issue that belongs in our development programs. This all has to play a more prominent role, and I think it's one of the reasons behind my own activities. When we talk openly about freedom of religion as part of our political dialogue, then we can bring about change. So does that mean that the issue shouldn't just be addressed by the development minister, but by all the other ministers in their negotiations as well? The government's coalition agreement specifically says that. The issue of freedom of religion is an integral part of our value-oriented foreign policy. So, of course, it has a place. The issue has to be at the center of our political discourse. Whether it's terrorism in Syria, Iraq, Africa, or in the Middle East, the discussion always revolves around Islam and radical Islam. That includes the debate over jihadist fighters returning to Germany from Syria. Does the rise of terrorism frighten you, from a religious perspective? Fear is always a bad advisor. I'm not frightened by the developments, but I am very concerned. It has to be said, because you can only change things when you tell the truth. Right now, radical Islam is the greatest threat to religious freedom. It has given rise to militant groups that are spreading terror across entire regions. We see that in Iraq and also in Nigeria with Boko Haram. What's happening there is unspeakable. What do you expect from Muslims in Germany? You've often pointed out that they have nothing to do with those Islamist groups and some have been unjustly detained. 
First of all, I agree that Muslims living in Germany have nothing to do with the Islamists in Nigeria, for instance. But it's still my wish that members of other religious groups give more support to the idea that freedom of religion is an inalienable human right. I'd like to see a clear position from the Association of Muslims in Germany. Es sich klar an die Seite stellen, Religionsfreiheit ist ein unveräußerliches Menschenrecht. Wenn man mit Experten spricht, When you talk to experts like Heiner Bielefeld, we often hear that dialogue is fundamental to halting religious persecution. Dialogue between religions. But at organized discussions, we see politicians, officials or experts talking among themselves. The dialogue stays in a small circle. What are they doing wrong? I also believe that discussion is necessary. And in the public discourse in Germany, we should always emphasize the issue of religious freedom. It's a great situation for Muslims in Germany that they can practice their religion freely and build mosques. We should point that out. But it's also clear that we can't fight extremist organizations in Iraq and Nigeria with dialogue alone. In Iraq, the tribe tribes and clans have links with the Islamists. So we have to ask ourselves if Iraq's political leaders have always received the best advice. We have to pay attention to that as well. Religion is often instrumentalized to occupy positions of power. Mr. Kauder, thank you. You're welcome.